professionally now since uh, my first book was published in 2001. Um, it was written actually in, in 1997, so it took, took it a long time to get published. Uh, it was a picture book. And we had to go through two different illustrators before we could find an illustrator who could, who could finally finish it. Um, but I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, uh, of reading and writing. And um, you were talking a little bit here about all of you have probably written stories or have done writing, and um, for those of you who haven't maybe yet, um, you're still here because you're reading, and that's the first step to being a writer. Um, people who write for a living can't be writers unless you're a reader first. Uh, reading is what helps you develop your voice as a writer, so reading uh, as many books as you can, as many different types of books as you can, exposing yourself to as many authors and their styles and the way that they use language and words. All of those ways are how we develop our voice as writers. There's a, uh, a very famous quote by a poet, an American poet named T.S. Eliot, who lived uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the last century. And he has this quote about writing, and he says that all writers borrow and great writers steal. And what he meant by that was not that uh, a writer steals another writer's work and claims it as his own, that's plagiarism. What he meant was that as writers, we are all products of the books that we have read, the writers that have come before us. And by reading Chaucer and Shakespeare and Mark Twain and Ernest Hemingway and John Steinbeck and J.K. Rowling and Stephanie Meyer and all of the writers that, all the books that you guys love, you don't even realize it, but those words and those stories are going into your brain and they're mushing around and mushing around. And when you write, those words come out as your voice and they come from those writers. So reading is really, really, really important if you're interested in writing. If uh, I were to offer advice to anybody um, at your grade level, I would say read. Number one, read. My second bit of advice is to write, and why is writing important? Now, some of you here, I'm, I'm sure probably most of you, have written stories, or you, you write, you go home and you write. You want to write novels, maybe you want to be a journalist, maybe you want to be a poet, uh, maybe you want to uh, someday own your own website where you write uh, uh, stories or jur investigative journalism, whatever. But whether or not you grow up to become a quote unquote professional writer, uh, learning to write well and improving your writing skills is something that will help you no matter what profession you choose. And the reason for that is, is because writing is a form of communicating. We as a society, we built our society, we built our civilization on our ability as human beings to communicate with one another. First by language and then by writing. Uh, uh, writing is a form of communication. So if you grow up to be an astronaut, you grow up <coughs> join the military, you become a police officer, a doctor, a lawyer, you go into business, no matter what profession you choose, the better able you are to express yourself in writing, to express your ideas, your beliefs, all those things, the better that you can do that, the better you're going to do in any profession that you choose. So proving your writing skills is not just for writing books or writing short stories or writing poems, it's for anything. It helps you learn to communicate more effectively. So reading and writing are really important. I get asked all the time uh, when I go around to schools. I've been, I, I counted the other day, and I've done school visits so far in 37 states uh, around the country. And I'm asked a lot of common questions. And uh, one of them is, uh, how did you get started writing? And the way that I got started writing was exactly what I just said. When I was a little kid, I grew up in a town here in Michigan, um, a little town called Homer, Michigan, which is about 100 miles away from here. 
And uh, this was a tiny little one stoplight town with about 1,500 people. Uh, 769 of the 1,500 people were cousins. So um, it was really, really small. Everybody knew everybody. I grew up in the late 60s and early 70s when we didn't have all the things that you guys have to entertain yourselves in your leisure time. We didn't have cable television. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have personal computers or smartphones or MyFace or Spacebook or any of the stuff that you guys have to spend, to spend your time on. We had television, but we only had two channels. Um, which meant that if the president was on that night, he was on both channels, so you couldn't watch Flipper that night. Um, but what we did have in town was a library, a very small library. And when I say small, I'm talking about the size of the space that we're in right about now. And every Saturday, while my parents did the shopping and the banking and all of that, that grown-up stuff that parents do, my sisters took me to the library, and we all would check out books, a big stack, and take them home and read them during the week and come back the following weekend and do the same thing. So that was my first step towards being a writer, was being a reader, and growing up with a love to read and learning at a very early age. Sometimes life teaches you lessons at a very early age, and you don't even realize that you're being taught it at the time. But what I was learning while I was reading all those books was that books just weren't for school. They weren't just for information. They weren't just for teaching me things, but that books were for entertainment, that they could be a tremendous source of entertainment books could take you away to other places that you could only imagine, that books could encourage and foster your imagination. So that was a really important lesson for me to learn at a very young age, and so I grew up being a lifelong reader with a lifelong love of reading. Uh, I read, I'm going to say, close to 80% of the books that we had in that small little library, um, and that was what started me on my first step, my journey to being, to being a writer, and now I look back and here I am. 45 years later with 20-some books published and, and more on the way. So the fact that you're here this morning, the fact that you're in book club, the fact that you're interested in books, the fact that you're interested in writing is a really good step. And what I would be willing to bet is that in a group this size, uh, that there are probably 20 or 30 of you in this group right now that um, are better writers than me. I get asked all the time about writing talent. Well, what is talent? Nobody has really been able to to uh, define talent uh, to a degree that satisfies me. But what I think with writing uh, is that writing is a craft, just like any other craft. If you want to be a better soccer player, how do you get better? Practice. You want to be a better musician, how do you get better? Practice. If you want to be a better writer, how do you get better at writing? Practice. Exactly. So the way that you improve your writing skills is by writing. And the great thing about writing is that you don't need a writing coach. You don't need a, a uniform or a lot of expensive equipment. You don't need your mom to drop you off and pick you up from writing practice. What you need is a piece of paper and a pencil. Or you can use a computer if you want, I guess. Uh, but you just sit down and you start writing. And writing and writing and writing and rewriting and looking at your sentences and looking at your paragraphs and going over your words and making sure that each single word that's on the page uh, has justified its existence on that page, and if it can't justify its existence, you take it out, and you put in a different word, or you leave it all together, and you practice, and you practice, and you practice. Authors um, don't just sit down, and I can attest to this, because I'm doing, right now I'm doing revisions on two different novels. Writers don't just sit down and, and type away and come up with uh, 800 pages of manuscript and send it off to their publisher and have it publishers, published. No, they work with editors, like you guys work with teachers when you have a writing assignment. And the, and the book comes back to them, the manuscript comes back to them, and it's all marked up with red ink or pencil or whatever your editor chooses to use. And you've got to go through it again and again and again. And like I said, you have to justify every single word on the page and make sure that it's uh, the best possible book that it, that it can be. Uh, I like to tell um, the story about writing my first novel. Um, which was Spy Goddess Live in Much Shop. And this is a story of the value of practice and revision and rewriting. Uh, I wrote that book. Um, it took me about six months of writing, just on about every day, three or four hours a day. And as I wrote, I did my own revisions, my own changes, my own things that I didn't like about the story. I would fix or move around or change characters or do all these things. But at the end of that six months, I had rewritten it, rewritten it, 
And I thought, um, I was in pretty good shape. I thought, boy, this is a really good manuscript. I'm really excited about it. And I'm gonna send it off to my editor. And I sent it off to her, and a few weeks later, it came back in a big, thick padded envelope. And I pulled it out and I looked at it, and the first page was completely covered in red ink. Completely. I mean, she had put a big X through my very first paragraph uh, and said, this has to go. And believe me, this first paragraph was one of the greatest first paragraphs that had ever been written in modern literature. It was going to go down in history along with, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, and all the other great opening lines and paragraphs that, uh, that we know. But she said, nope, it's got to go because the first line of your second, sentence, second paragraph, that's your opening. And so I looked through this page after page after page, and every single page, almost every single line, it looked like my editor had gone to her local office max and bought up every single red pen that they had and used them all on my manuscript. And she uh, sent me a letter along with this uh, uh, explosion of red ink, as I like to refer to it now. And in this letter, she said, Dear Mike, uh, we want to congratulate you for a fabulous first job on your first draft. And I looked at the paper, I looked at the letter, and I scratched my head. And I thought for a minute, maybe she put the wrong letter in with the wrong manuscript, and there was another mic she was working with. She said, no, you've created a great character, you've created a great world, you've done a really fabulous job with the character's voice. She said, what we would like you to do is to look at the attached memo of changes, corrections, and revisions for this wonderful manuscript. Uh, and get back to us. And I pulled out this memo that was in the in the envelope too, and she wasn't lying. Thirteen pages, single space, of revisions, changes, and corrections. And it took me four months of work going back and forth through that memo, line by line, making all these changes and corrections to the story, going back and forth with her about things that I liked that she didn't like, and things that she liked that I didn't like. And it took a long, long time, a long time, get through and finally get that book ready to help to be published. Well, was it worth it? Well, when the book came out, uh, it was nominated by Mystery Writers of America for Best Young Adult Mystery. So it was worth it. It was worth going through all those changes and revisions and, and all that work and practice. And like I said, it took me a long time. It took a lot of work. It took a lot of effort. And that's what writing is. Writing, good writing, is just effort. As much effort as you put into it is the effort that you'll get out of it. So when I think about that a lot now, and I still have the first page of that very first novel pinned up on my office wall, and any time I'm writing and any time I get a manuscript back from my, my editor, uh, uh, I look at that first page and I remember. And I remember what she said because what she said in the letter um, wasn't as important as what she didn't say. She didn't say in the letter, um, man, you stink as a writer. Uh, boy, this is some of the worst writing we've ever read. Boy, we can't believe we even signed up this book. That's not what she said. What she said was, together, you and I are going to work to make this book as good as it can be. And that is what your teachers are telling you when you turn in a paper and it comes back and you work really hard on it and hard on it and hard on it. And you think, man, this paper is just perfect. And you get it back and it's all marked up and your teacher's got all these suggestions for how to make it better. Um, that's what the teacher is doing. They're telling you that we're going to work together to make your writing as good as it can be. And it takes practice and it takes effort. Now, the moral to the story is, when I wrote the second book in the Spy Goddess series, and the manuscript came back, uh, the memo of revisions was only seven pages long. So I went from 13 pages down to seven. <coughs> and when I wrote the, the first Youngest Templar book, Youngest Templar Keeper of the Grail, and the revision memo came back, it was three pages long. And when I wrote the second book and it came back, the revision memo was just a little under two pages long, and then about a page and a half for the third book. So I'm working down to get my editors down to like a single page. Um, one of these days, I hope that I'll get to accomplish that. Um, so what I'm saying is, is that practice, work, effort, just like anything else in life, uh, the more you put into it, the more that you'll get out of it. So that's a little bit um, about how I got started. Um, I saw some questions that you guys had done um, before I came up here that were sent to me, and one of the questions was, where did you get the idea for uh, the Spy Goddess? Has anybody read Spy Goddess uh, in the no. book club or in the library or read Keeper of the Grail? Has anybody read J.K. Rowling? Okay, cool. Um, but anyway, 
The Spy Guys novel is about a girl from Beverly Hills, California. She grows up very rich and wealthy, and she gets uh, in a little bit of trouble being in, uh, in with the wrong people in the wrong place at the wrong time. And instead of being sent off to this juvenile detention center, the judge gives her a choice between going 30 days in this juvenile detention center or a year at this boarding school in rural Pennsylvania. And she looks around and sees that she's kind of this Beverly Hills princess, and she probably wouldn't do um, really well in juvenile detention, and besides the orange jumpsuits tend to clash with her complexion. Um, so she chooses this boarding school. She goes off to this boarding school, and after she's there for a little while, she discovers that this boarding school is not like any other uh, school around. It's got all these secret places in it, all these secret things are going on, stuff she doesn't know about. She doesn't like not being in the know. Um, and as the story unfolds, she sort of uh, stumbles into it, kind of like a, this sort of clumsy fish out of water, and she discovers that... Um, the school has actually been set up to be a school to teach kids how to become spies. So she gets involved in this mystery, the headmaster of the school who uh, teaches these kids all the tricks they need to do, know to brief spies disappears. She has to go off and find them with a couple of her friends and, and so after that it's all just action and adventure and stuff blowing up and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that was my, my first novel. Uh, after that, I wrote a series called The Youngest Templar. Um, this was a, a historical fiction, and this is about a boy who grows up uh, in the Middle Ages, and he's left uh, as an orphan on the steps of a monastery. And uh, he grows up in this monastery with these monks, and one day, a group of knights called the Knights Templar uh, come through the abbey uh, where he lives to rest for the night, and one of the knights there uh, becomes impressed by uh, the boy and the way he carries himself and supports himself and asks this young boy who is about to turn 15 if he would be his squire. And a squire to a knight is sort of like an assistant. Um, a knight would uh, have to uh, have someone that would help him with their armor and uh, take care of their horse and feed their horse and all sharpen their weapons and all those kinds of things. So. The boy thinks this is an opportunity for action and adventure, so sure, he takes off with this group of knights and he goes off to the Holy Land, fights in the Crusades, and, and during uh, uh, a critical battle uh, in, the, in, the in the Holy Land, uh, his knight, uh, Sir uh, Thomas, gives him uh, a very, very valuable and sacred religious relic and tells him that he has to carry this relic uh, back to England for safekeeping. He has to leave, uh, sneak out of the city by secret passage and get away and take this relic. And then there are people that know about the relic. They will try to stop him. He can't trust anyone. Uh, he has to get back to England at no matter the cost. And so he undertakes this, uh, this journey. And along the way, he's met up, uh, uh, saved from some bandits by a young archer who uh, happens to be named uh, 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 Robin Hood, who is on his way back to England. And a little bit later, they meet up with a young girl who belongs to this cult of Muslim warriors called the al Hashishin, And they save her life, so she's on her bound to, uh, to uh, repay the favor. So all three of them band together, and they have to take the, uh, this relic back to, back to England. It's all action again, action and adventure and stuff blowing up and sword fights and dungeons and secret agents of the king and evil knights and there's a little tiny dog in it. Um, so it's got all kinds, it's got all all kinds of just fun uh, stuff and that's the kind of stuff that I like to write. To write, I like to write the kind of books I like to read. I like to read action and adventure uh, novels and and uh, books where there's a, a, a secret and the hero uh, has to learn to trust people and. And uh, usually he's on his own, but eventually he finds that there are people that uh, that uh, uh, he can trust to uh, help him uh, on his quest. And uh, one one librarian once told me that my books, uh, my novels, are all about about friendship. What the true meaning of friendship is: um, loyalty, uh, standing by your friends when things are tough, not not when it's just not done, not when it's easy, but when it's the hardest. So those are uh, some of the books I've written. I've also written a lot of picture books uh, for younger kids. Um, 
but uh, I'm working on two new novels right now. Um, uh, the newest book that it, uh, will be for uh, for young readers is called The Raven's Shadow, and it takes place in the 1820s in Philadelphia and Washington, D.C., and it features three young boys. Um, one is named Edgar Allan Poe, one is named Abraham Lincoln, one is named uh, Charles Darwin, and together the three of them meet up and uh, discover that a very evil, evil thing from Europe has descended on America, a man known, known as Count Dracula and they have to save the world from, from this evil count. So that's coming out uh, either in 2012 or 2013, I'm not sure. Have any of you in here read Roland Smith at all? Roland Smith? Okay, well, I'm also writing a series with Roland Smith uh, that will be out uh, in the next uh, year or so. So uh, does anybody have any questions? I got a whole uh, list of questions, so there must be some questions. How many books are in the Three books. The trilogy. The question was, how many books are in the youngest two book series? The three. <coughs> what made you get started? What made you get started? Well, I always, uh, um, like I said, I grew up loving books and loving to read. And at some point in my life, I'm not exactly sure uh, when, I just decided that I loved reading so much that um, writing books would have to be a really cool job. And uh, I wanted to take a crack at it. So uh, you only get one go around uh, in this life. So if you have a dream and uh, your dream is, is to be a writer or a musician or anything like that, it's something you should try to follow. I got two questions. Okay, what I have two answers. Well, what was your first book that you came out with? The first book that I came out with was a picture book called The Legend of Blue Jacket. A story about a young boy who was captured, a true story, about a young boy in the 1760s who was captured by Shawnee Indians and uh, became an adopted member of the Shawnee tribe and lived with them for the rest of his life. Do you know how long that took you to make this book? How long did it take me to, to write the first book? Well, um, the big thing about writing is that most writers, uh, that I know at least, spend more time doing research. Uh, than they do actually writing. When I wrote the, uh, the Youngest Templar series, I spent about two and a half years doing research on the, on the Middle Ages um, before I even wrote a single word. Um, for Legend of Blue Jacket, I would say I, I spent about a year and a half doing research, and then it took me about six or eight months to write the manuscript. It was my, first, it was my very first try, so I made a lot of mistakes, went down a lot of, a lot of wrong roads, had to turn around and come back and go down another road. In the beginning, like, um, did you say you lived on the corner of Lippincott Road? No, I said I lived around the corner on Lippincott Road. Oh, because I live on Lippincott Oh, no, it's a pretty, pretty cool road, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> How easy is it to make a living off of writing? How easy is it to make a living off of writing? It's not easy. If you were going to go into writing for the money, choose, uh, choose something else. Um, it's, there aren't very many writers, unfortunately. Uh, or at least I feel it's unfortunately, that are able to make uh, 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 make their entire living from writing. Now, there are, uh, are a few, obviously, uh, J.K. Rowling and Stephanie Meyer and um, you know people like that. There's, I always say that there's the uh, pyramid uh, 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 for authors in terms of the money they make, and the, and the Stephanie Meyers and the J.K. Rowlings, they're up here at the top of the pyramid, and the Mike Spradlins are way down here under the foundation. <coughs> Um, so it's not something that you, uh, any profession, I don't think it means, uh, it matters. Um, no matter what you choose to do in life, it's not something that you should choose, I believe, uh, for uh, monetary reasons. You should do what you do in life because you love it. And if you do something that you love, uh, you're going to do better because you love doing it. And if you, uh, there's an old saying, uh, do what you love and the money will fall. And that, that's true. So I always tell people who are interested in writing, it's very hard to get published. Um, it's very even harder to make uh, a, a living at it. But uh, so always have a plan B. Go to college, uh, get a degree, and um, you know write uh, write at night, write on the side. Uh, J.K. Rowling was broke before she wrote Harry Potter. She was actually living in England. Uh, she was so poor. 
uh, that she uh, uh, was was essentially almost <coughs> homeless, and she wrote the first Harry Potter book in coffee shops on legal pads because she couldn't afford a computer. Uh, and then look what happened to her. Now she has a, a theme park. So um, there's there's no 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 reason to believe that that some of you in here. If you're really truly, if writing is really truly what it is that you want to spend your life doing, no reason to believe that you can't do it. What it takes is effort. Like I said, effort and time and practice, uh, and and you can achieve it. 